Good morning. I was just thanking Jim for that fine sermon. That was great. Um, sadly for you, there's another one yet to come. So, um, Hey, today, welcome. We're returning to our uh, study of the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 4 today. Uh, we had a couple of weeks where we took off. One was for Mother's Day, and then we had a, our friend uh, Gabe Cleeter who was, came in and spoke. Uh, great message on repenting of bitterness and getting free. So, uh, but today we return to Galatians. We're going to be in chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And as I was preparing this sermon, I thought, <clears throat> there is absolutely no freaking way I'm going to get through this entire chapter in one session. Everybody be running out of the room screaming because it'd take a couple of hours, you know. But, uh, but we're going to be looking at uh, Galatians 4, verses 1 through 11 today. I'm just going to read it, and uh, uh, we will follow along, hopefully. I don't know what page this is on in your pew Bible, but somebody know? 1167, if you want to turn there and follow along. Uh, while we're turning to that, let me just apologize for all the clinkers in the trumpet playing today. Drew surprised me by changing keys on those songs, and I kept in my mind, going back to the key I was used to. Terrible. Not his fault. That's, my, that's all on me. However, here we are. And God was praised anyway. So, now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So we too, when we were children, were held in bondage under the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Hallelujah. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles to which you want to be enslaved all over again. You meticulously observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in, in vain. Wow. A very powerful passage here. And it is where, in this book of Galatians, Paul has been talking, uh, as it were, about the fundamentals of the faith and, and uh, the need of people to uh, receive Christ as their Savior and, and that it is a gift of grace from God. But now he turns and he says, why, why are you giving up the gift of grace, the forgiveness, the freedom that you have been given in Christ Jesus? He laments that the people that he to are being led astray what a what a sad thing for him as the teacher the man who labored amongst them to see them turning aside from the truth of the gospel and seeking the world's system of relief you know in verses one through three it says even the master's son when a child may be corrected by a servant it doesn't matter that the child may grow up to rule over the servant someday while still a child, the servant is in charge of the child and given authority over him by the father. This is uh, something I think we have seen in the world. This is not a mystery. Most people have encountered at some time or another someone who has you know, substantial means or something and, and their children are cared for by s other servants. They may be hired, hired staff. They may be uh, that family member that is down and out and comes to live with them and, and cares for the kids, but 
there are people in this world who are born into wealth and power, but as children, they are not entrusted with any of that. Some cases, people have guardians, trustees, often a, a trusted attorney for the family who watches over the finances and makes sure that the kids don't squander the principal while they're still kids. And the, the kids oftentimes don't come into their, their uh, inheritance until, in some cases, 18, sometimes 21. I, I've known people who didn't come into it until they were 30. I mean, I think those parents were particularly prudent in that case because those people took forever to grow up. But, but um, this concept is well known in the world that you, the, the kids, even though they are heirs of great and powerful gifts, are not entrusted with those until they're older. And in their youth, people who have far less power far or less authority are given power and authority over them to raise them up. Well, Paul is making a statement here that I think most of us can recognize. If we haven't known people like that, we've watched a movie in which such things occurred or something. It's a well-known phenomenon in the world. Jewish and Greek cultures in Paul's era had set times when a child became a man. The Jews had and still have the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah for, girls, for boys and girls. And that occurs around the age of 13. At that time, the boy or girl is assumed to become a man or woman. The Romans, on the other hand, did not have a set age when a boy became a man. It seems that Paul is referring in this passage to the Roman custom because for Romans... The father determined the time when a boy was recognized as a man. So it is with Christians. It is God the Father who determines our maturity, and it isn't measured in years, but in spiritual growth. I'm sorry to say I have known people well advanced in years who were infants in Christ. They had found Jesus as their Savior, and effectively stopped at that point. They never grew. They never matured in Christ. Their interest in studying the Word of God and in knowing God had rapidly waned, and they just existed as Christians. Do I think they're in heaven when they die? Yes, absolutely, because the promises of God are without repentance, and he promised salvation to those who confess Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Amen? But does, have they prospered? Have they grown and matured in Christ? No. They are still infants. And yet I have known people who, at a young age, found Jesus as their Savior, and they took off like a rocket, and they just wanted more and more and more, and they sought out God's Word, and they struggled to know more of Him, and they sought fellowship with the Father, and they grew rapidly. I think of Billy Graham standing on a stump in an orange grove in central Florida and preaching to the trees because he just had to get it out. He had to get that word out and how he developed as a, as a man of God, at a, as a very young man, as a teenager. And that work of grace that was working in him resulted in the salvation of millions. Well... Paul refers, in verse 3, to the elemental things of the world. The word used here in the Greek is stoicheia, which came to be understood as the ABCs. In other words, like a kid learning the alphabet. These were the basic fundamentals that one had to learn. So, the basic things that Paul is referring to here is not really the alphabet or the three R's. It's the <clears throat> elemental things of life on earth. The Bible scholar Cole translates the idea, so too we, when we were young children, were kept in slavery to the ABCs of the universe. The idea of the ABCs of the universe is important. If there is any fundamental ABC of the universe or elementary principle, 
that we must break free from and that is stressed in pagan religion just as much as Jewish law. It is the principle of cause and effect. One may call it karma or you get what you deserve or something else, yet it rules nature and the minds of men. We live under the idea that we get what we deserve. When we are good, we deserve to receive good. And when we are bad, we deserve to receive bad. Is there anybody here who hasn't felt that was the fundamental lesson of life? No. Everybody understands that that happens. There is an if-then statement. If you work hard, you will find success. If you are a sloth, you will probably not find success. These are based on the observable surroundings in our world. You can see these lessons in life around you. The thing is, Paul told the Galatians to go beyond this elements of the universe and into an understanding of God's grace. Grace contradicts this ABCs of the universe because under grace, God does not deal with us on the basis of what we deserve. Thank you, Jesus. God does not deal with us on the basis of what we deserve. Because if he did, there'd be nobody in this place. There'd just be, you know, ashes on the floor because we all have been consumed by the righteous judgment of God. Our good cannot justify us under grace. Our bad needs not condemn us. God's blessing and favor is given on a principle completely alien and apart from the ABCs of the universe. His blessing and favor is given for reasons that are completely in him and have nothing to do with us. I mean, this is so radical. I mean, it's crazy because we know, I look around me and I say, well, that guy's a bad guy. He does bad things, so he's going to reap bad things in his life. That's how the world works. If you plant bad seed, you get a bad harvest. If you plant good seed, you get a good harvest. Amen? I mean, we all see that, and we say, that's the way the world works. And yet God says, but no. And he made the world. He instituted these observable facts as we understand them in the world. But he says, I'm not bound by that. I can do anything I want to do because I'm God and I made you and I made this world and everything you observe is there because I put it into place. I am above it. I am in it, but I am not constrained by it. His spirit is alive and working in the universe, but he is not bound by it in any way and he has decided in his own goodness that instead of holding you to account for what you have done, you miserable sinners, this miserable sinner, he has instead said, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I do not care that you have done those things because I sent my son to pay the price for you. And even though you were a massive screw-up, still in all, I love you. And I have put the blame and the punishment the entirety of my wrath against sin on my only begotten son so that you can be free so that I can be free make no mistake about it we're all in this together and praise God he has granted mercy and grace to us who did not deserve it who don't deserve it now you know I I walk with the Lord and I am a Christian and people say oh he must be a good man because hey he's an elder in the church and all that kind of stuff and you know what I screw up every day I wish that weren't so, but I do. I screw up every day. And the things I used to screw up on that were big and large in my life, God has mercifully freed me from some of those, and I don't do those things anymore. I only to encounter other things I wasn't even aware of that were sin. And now I'm having to deal with those things. And it's like, does this ever end? And the, and the real truth of the matter is, no, not in this world. As long as we're here, we are working out our salvation. We are coming to maturity in Christ, but we are not there yet. We have not arrived. Paul himself said, I am in this race but I have not arrived. And that is how we are to live our lives, seeking after the things of God, seeking to improve, but understanding nothing that we do, good or bad, is going to justify us. 
It is the blood of Jesus Christ that justifies us and makes us holy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Oh, praise God. You know, the ABCs, thank you, the, the ABCs of the universe, they're not bad in themselves. We do and must use these principles in life. When you go to your job, you can't say, I'm washing the blood of the lamb, therefore, it doesn't matter what I do here. Your boss may disagree with you. If you show up late and if you fail to work, you may find yourself unemployed. And that will be reaping the harvest that you sowed. On the other hand, you can show up there and do a really good job, be that faithful servant who uh, works not unto man but as unto the Lord, and you'll be valued and esteemed, and you still may lose your job. Sometimes things happen in this world. The rules shift. And things are not always rock solid. What is true, though, is that the things of God never change. So I'm not saying that we don't have a reason for adhering to these rules, the ABCs, the elemental things of life in this world. We do in the physical. But we must not base our relationship to God on this principle. Since we are now under grace, he does not deal with us on the principle of earning and deserving. Because this is such an elementary principle, it is so hard for us to shake this kind of thinking. But it is essential if we will walk in grace. When we live on the principle of earning and deserving before God, we live in bondage. Bondage to the elemental things of the world. False teaching is according to these elemental principles and not according to Jesus. That's what it comes down to. False teaching every time will take you back to these elemental principles of things in the world. That's what it does. And it appeals to people and draws people because in their flesh it seems right. There's truth here because, hey, if I do good, I get good things, and if I do bad, I get bad things. And people understand that as what Paul called an elemental thing, stoicheia. The problem with that is it does not align with God's principles at all for how we are to live as Christians. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human traditions in accordance with the elementary principles of the world rather than in accordance with Christ. In Jesus, we die to the elemental principles of the world. Colossians 2.20 says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees from others? This is insanity, and we fall into it too easily because of the habits of the flesh. But is not, we are dead to sin, but we are also dead to the elementary principles of this world. We live in it, but not of it, amen? We walk through this world of sin and woe, of despair and depression, hopelessness and fear, and we shine with the joy of the Lord. We shine with the light of God because we are not in this world, or rather of this world. We have been raised above. We are joint heirs with the only begotten Son of God. How great is that? He died for us. We didn't have to die. He died for us so that we could be joint heirs and, and inheriting all that he has in God the Father. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's so much. I, I was just working on the sermon. I'm like, I can't believe this myself. I mean, I do believe it, but it's like overwhelming to think about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. You are not your own. Jesus Christ has paid the price for you. When the devil comes along and says, you're a loser, you're a failure, or, you know, there's no hope for you, say, shut up in Jesus' name, because it's not his place to condemn you, and it is not your place to receive condemnation. You're dead to that. You've been bought by Christ Jesus, and no longer is it you that lives, but Christ Jesus in you. Amen? 
So when the devil comes along and starts saying all that crap to you, you have a responsibility. The responsibility is to say, no, I don't accept this lie. That's all that is, you're responsible for. You were responsible for standing on what the Word says instead of what some liar is whispering in your ear. And when he sends relatives to you to tell you what a bum you are, that makes it all the harder because you don't want to offend your relatives or maybe, you know, you, you are looking for their approval. A lot of guys are looking for the approval of their dads. A lot of girls are looking for the approvals of their dads or their moms. And the fact is, Sometimes our parents don't know what they're talking about. But the word of God is always true. Sometimes mom says the wrong thing. Sometimes dad acts a fool. I know it shouldn't be said, but sometimes that happens. Men are not always perfect. Sometimes they act like self-centered so-and-sos and don't care about anybody but themselves. And you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's the word of God that is truth, not what your daddy says. It's the word of God that's the truth, not what your mommy says. It's the word of God that we anchor our souls to, and that is what carries us through this world, not just surviving, but in victory. I say it again, in victory. Praise God. Hallelujah. Verses 4 to 5 say, in the fullness of time, well, that's like saying when the time was right when the time was right god had a moment that was just right for jesus to be born under the law jesus was born under the law make no mistake and he lived his life in accordance with the law and he kept the law successfully and well without any error which is something that none of us have ever managed to do nor did his parents or anybody before the only person who has ever been perfect is jesus christ He served that function so that he could be the blameless, unblemished sacrifice for all of us. Praise God. No doubt, many people had yearned for centuries waiting for the promised Messiah. Yet God's timing was impeccable. With the Roman Empire, roads were built throughout the ancient world. (coughs) Excuse me. The rule of law was implemented throughout the empire, and travel became something more reasonable than it had been in earlier days. I mean... You know, traveling could kill you back in ancient times. Pardon me. With a universal language, Greek, it became possible to travel to foreign lands and still communicate with the natives. In addition, the timetable given to Daniel some 480 years before was coming to an end. So the timing was perfect with, in accordance with the prophecies that God had given through Daniel but also the circumstances of the world itself had been transformed, making it possible to travel the globe, the known world, and share the gospel, and there was a common language. Not unlike today. One of the great fortunes of being an American is that you learn English. A lot of Americans learn other languages in high school and college, and that's great. Some learn it at the the feet of their parents because they have parents that speak another language. That's all wonderful, but the vast majority of Americans speak English, and hopefully they speak it pretty well, but I've heard a lot of them that, you know, I've questioned their actual knowledge of English itself. And uh, um, I have some relatives in Alabama, and they speak to me, and I go, what? And they say it again, I go, I'm sorry, what was that? And the third time, I just give up, say, oh, okay, because I still don't understand what they said. And, uh, uh, you know, and I'm from the South, but their, their particular Southern dialect is so thick, I can't catch it. So, uh, what's that? (laughs) Yeah, what am I talking about? Yeah, so, while Jesus was born under the law, I was going to say, but we live in a world where you can speak English everywhere. I mean, if you go to Tokyo, you're finding people that speak English. And why is that? Because it's the language of commerce. People want to make money, and English has because of the British Empire in the 19th century, English spread around the globe. The saying was during Queen Victoria's era that the sun never set on the British Empire because it was everywhere, and they spoke English. And anybody who wanted to get ahead in the British Empire learned to speak English right quick because that was the way to to make your way in that empire. 
And as a result of that, even though we are, we are some of those people that just said, we don't want to be part of the British Empire, and, and the rebels that we are cast that all off, except for our fascination with the royalty these days, which I do not understand. Um, we have stood apart from that, and yet it is that English tradition that has defined this country both in language and in culture. And though we have taken in many other cultures over the course of time, at the core, there is an English sensibility formed by thinkers like John Locke and others that established us as a nation. And our founding fathers sought out information from those like Locke and Edmund Burke and others, and they were informed by their philosophy and reasoning, and that is how they came up with what I think is the greatest document short of the Bible in the world. That is the U.S. Constitution. It's an astounding document. There has nev never been another one like it. Even the people that copy it always want to change a few things here and there, and it's always to weaken their, their Constitution. Ours is the greatest that has been written in the annals of mankind. It is the culmination of centuries of growth and maturity and study by, by scholars. And our founding fathers were geniuses. It's just amazing that these men gathered together in Philadelphia and came up with this document. They argued about and twisted and tw contorted, and they finally got it worked out to where they could all agree on it. Uh, and, you know, it's astonishing. It is a work of God, a work of grace that that document exists. And that to some degree or another, we still adhere to it 283 years later or whatever it is. And, you know, praise God for that. Now I'm, I'm digressing from the text, so let me get back to it. While Jesus was born under the law, he came to redeem us from that law and adopt us into God's family. Again, there is a Roman example that served Paul's illustration. It was common in Rome for a person to be adopted into a family. Those who were adopted shared an inheritance equal to that of a son born into the family. There was no distinction between those who were born of the parents and those who were adopted by the parents. This is amazing, but true. Jesus came to free us from sin, but also from the elemental things of the world. It is not what we can do for God that saves us, but what he did for us that saves us. It is humbling to realize that we deserved death, but Jesus came to give us life. Note that Jesus could have saved us from our sins without the additional step of making us his joint heirs. You know, he could have just said, you're saved, and that's that. We don't inherit anything. We just get saved. And that would have been grace, marvelous grace in itself, would it not? I mean, we deserve death. And if he'd have just said, you're saved, that would have been a fantastic gift. But God's love for us is so great that that wasn't enough. Just to save us from our miserable, rotten selves, that wasn't enough. He had to do more because of his love. And he said, I'm not just seeing to it that you are saved from sin and de depravity, that you're saved from judgment and wrath. No, I want you to come and be my children. We are adopted into the family, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He paid the price, and we get the inheritance. How great is that? If you're here, or if you're listening online, and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, there is no better deal in the world. I don't care if they're offering you 0% interest on that new car. That is nothing compared to this gift. God paid the price so that you could be a joint heir with Jesus Christ of all of God's essence, of everything that is God. He is pouring it out without repentance and without hesitation and without limits you are entitled to everything that jesus has <clears throat> i mean I, it blows my mind see my mind it's blown <laughs> you are entitled to everything jesus has and you may sit there and you think well yes tom but you know i know how i am well, I know how you are too, and I know how I am. We're not deserving of it. Of course not. Who said we were? It's a work of grace. God has chosen you and you and you and you and me, praise God, 
to be his children. He loves us and has loved us since before the foundations of the world. You think you're just this miserable little schnook here in this world? Well, you are in the eyes of other people probably, but not in the eyes of God. To him, you are an amazing, beautiful child that he loves. You ever seen a young mother and father with that baby that was just born? They're fascinated looking at those little fingers and stuff and, and look, look at that little crease in their cheek. Oh, it's so cute. Oh, you know, and they just can't get enough. You know, A couple of weeks later with no sleep, maybe they have had enough, but in that moment, they are thrilled. And I think that's how God sees us. Uh, you know, it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And I think some of the conversations go like this. Hey, Jesus, did you see Tom? Do you see what he did? Oh, that was adorable. And uh, Jesus says, yeah, I saw. He's fantastic, isn't he? You did so good, Dad, with him. Me, I look at me in the mirror and I think, oh, man, you know, falling apart. This is terrible, you know. But that's not how they look at you or me. God loves us, and he knows so much more about us. It says in here, Paul said, we are known by God. Oh, hallelujah. We are known by God. He knows our essence. He knows the things we don't even admit to ourselves, that we don't know about ourselves. He knows us. Talk about elemental things. He knows us and the atomic structure that forms us. And he knows our heart. Sometimes that makes me shudder. But I know that he knows even the worst of me. And he loves me anyway. Praise God. Well, you know, there's a thing that we say sometimes. I, I, Jimmy made reference to it actually in that sermon on co communion there, and uh, I'm just kidding, uh, about how we return to, to the garden, you know, we return to that, ad that Adamic state. But you know, that's not really what happens. Not at all. When we find Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are in a better place than Adam ever had. You know, Adam was there in the garden, and it was a holy and great place with no sin at all. And then we think about that, and we think, wow, wouldn't that be great? No sin, no temptation to sin, no presence of evil in any way. And I have to admit, that sounds pretty fine. But you know what would happen? <clears throat> it says in the Word, in Genesis there, that God would come and visit with Adam. So here's Adam, here's God over there, and they come and they meet. Well, guess what? When Tom wants to visit with God, God's here, right here. I have a relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit that Adam never had. As a matter of fact, I dare say, if Adam had had that kind of relationship, maybe he wouldn't have eaten from that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But he was just a man, a really great man, apparently with great power and authority given to him to rule over the earth. And yet, he didn't have that. What is alive in you, the Holy Spirit at work in you, the relationship that you have with God is something Adam can only envy. All those great prophets. I look at the life of Elijah and I think, I want to be like him. Man, that guy was amazing, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. He just, just so powerful and so authoritative and, and full of faith. And then I read, of course, the times when maybe he wasn't so full of faith, but God would speak to him and strengthen him, and suddenly he's a man of faith again, and that's great. But here's the thing. Elijah wanted what we have. We look at him, we want to be like him. No, not at all. He wanted what we have, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, salvation through Jesus Christ. Elijah looked forward to the time when Jesus would come. We look back and give good thanks to God for the fact that he already came. And that we are walking in the might and the majesty and the power of Almighty God. You are not just you. You are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You are empowered by God, not just to walk through this world, 
but to just travel right over this world. But the enemy gets in your way, you just put them under your feet. You don't have to truck with him and his nonsense. Tell him to shut up and get out in the name of Jesus. And the thing is, Jesus said of, of the, the devil that he was the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. You don't have to be nice to a murderer and the father of lies. As I said, no being polite. No, excuse me, please go away from me. None of that. No, shut up, get out of here in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I command you to be bound, your mouth gagged and muzzled, and get out of my sight in Jesus' name. The word says the enemy comes at me one way. He flees from me seven ways, which is perfection, a perfect removal of the enemy. The same is true for you. The same promises are for all of us. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, we have a better position in Christ Jesus than Adam had. And we're not looking to go back to the garden. We're looking to go to glory, to be with the Lord in his presence. Amen? So, verses 6 and 7. Because we are sons filled with God's Holy Spirit, we come to God the Father, not whimpering, not, oh, no, poor me. No, rather, but crying out, Daddy, Daddy. The word Abba is ancient Aramaic for Daddy. I mean, literally, Daddy. Jesus called his father Abba in Mark, what is that, 14.6, I think. No, 14.36. While in the garden praying, we are given the same relationship with our Heavenly Father as Jesus has. We aren't Jesus, and we aren't the only begotten Son of God. But our relationship with God is that of Father and Son, just like his. Sons aren't slaves, and slaves aren't sons. We are no longer slaves to the world and our flesh. We have become children of God and are fully entitled to God's grace and unmerited favor. One of the sad things I see in this world is that so many of us fail to grasp that truth and consider the implications of it. If we are joint heirs with God, with Jesus, and if we are fully entitled to God's grace and unmerited favor, think about it. What does that mean for your life? This has implications of great power and change in our lives. We don't have to be beat down nothings. <clears throat> we are entitled to show the love of God everywhere we go and to minister his grace to others. The, it doesn't put us in a position where we go around lording it over people. Not at all. Did Jesus do that? No, not at all. But it does give us the same rights and authority that he exercised in this world. When you go to a restaurant for lunch today, and the waitress comes up to you, and you say, and what's your name? And she says, well, my name's Maria, or she says some other name. And you go, oh, how nice. <clears throat> when you're getting ready to ask a blessing over that meal, and I expect that you will ask a blessing over that meal because you are like Jesus, and he asked a blessing over the meal. And when you do that, before you do that, you say, Maria, we're about to pray. What can we pray for you? And you may get a look like, no, thank you, and they walk away. But more often than not, you know what you're going to get? Well, to be honest with you, I have this problem, and they share something with you, and you say, we have confidence that our God will meet your need. When we pray, expect to see a change. That's being like Jesus. When you're standing in line at the grocery store, and because you got in that line, immediately it comes to a dead stop. Ever notice how that happens? Um, it's amazing. I get into a grocery line, and it's been zipping along, and the minute I get in it, the next person in line has an ATM card that doesn't work or they want cigarettes because, so the cashier has to leave and go down to the service desk and get cigarettes and bring them back. All those things that happen, you know, and I'm standing there and I'm like, you know, watching my watch and I'm thinking, I just wanted to buy these few little purchases. Why is this happening to me? And woe is me and oh, <laughs> my life is so hard. And, you know, I, I can get so ticked off. But then the person in front of me turns around and says, 
you know, this happens to me every time I get here. And you begin to strike up a conversation with them, and you commiserate on the sadness of your life as you stand in the grocery aisle. And that's a moment where you can, when you can say, you know, this ha seems to happen to me a lot too, but that's okay because I'm having a great day. And they say, really? And why is that? I can say, because Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I have been blessed coming in and going out. I'm blessed in the country. I'm blessed in the city. Whatever I set my hand to is going to prosper. That's what the Bible says. They say, really? And you say, absolutely. And you begin to share with them, and you have a moment there in the grocery store. That's being like Jesus. That whining part, that's not being like Jesus, you know. Well, anyway, we are fully entitled to God's grace and unmerited favor. Verses 8 through 11, Paul is amazed that the Galatians who knew God were willingly accepting a second-class citizenship by adopting the legalisms of those false teachers who wanted to place them under the Jewish law and customs. Where they had been slaves to the world and false gods and were adopted as sons of God, they now wanted to return to being slaves of the elemental things. They were seeking to observe days and months and seasons and years in the way of Jewish religious observances. Unlike the Judaizers, we and the Galatians are free. We have elected to make Sunday the Sabbath, but a case can be made that there is no day of the week, month, or year that is to be exalted over another. Every day in Christ Jesus is a beautiful day. Every day in Christ Jesus, we observe the blessings of the Father upon us. The idea of returning to a works-based legalism can seem weirdly appealing to our flesh. After all, it puts us in the position of doing for God. However, this exaltation of the flesh is the opposite of exalting God the Father. The Galatians weren't growing in their spiritual walk, but were returning to the old idea of works-based salvation. What a tragedy to go back to that unsuccessful idea rather than holding fast to the truth that set them and us free. Warren Wearsby said, one of the tragedies of legalism is that it gives the appearance of spiritual maturity when in reality it leads the believer back into a, quote, second childhood, unquote, of Christian experience. You know, babies believe in the elemental things of the world. Mature Christians know better. They know that the grace of Almighty God has been poured out and has saved undeserving us. It's only babies that believe they can work towards salvation and earn salvation. I used to work with a guy who was uh, from India, <clears throat> and he was a really smart guy. Most of the Indians I've met are really smart people. They don't get to this country by being dumb, you know. And, uh, and one day we were talking, and he was Hindu, and, I, and we began to talk, and I, I shared with him that unlike his faith, our faith was based on the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, had elected to humiliate himself, to come in the form of a human being and suffer the wrath of God, not for, their own sin, for his own sin, but for our sins. And I was surprised at his reaction. I thought that was pretty good news, you know. He actually got angry with me, I mean really mad, and it's like, no, there's no way. That's not possible. Here's the way things are. And he starts giving me these elemental, you know, the, the ABCs of the world. And I thought to myself, how sad. How sad that he couldn't hear this good news as good news, but rather heard it as an attack on his definition of how life is, you know. He had a neat little box arranged there, and you, how dare you Grab that box and rattle it. Paul expressed his dismay at the Galatians' desire to return to the world's way of worship, even going so far as to say that he feared for them. He had worked hard to bring the Galatians to Christ Jesus, yet here they were, list, returning to a false understanding of God's love and forgiveness. <clears throat> In vain, 
David Guzik has this to say about Paul's work being in vain. At the end of this section, Paul set a choice before the Galatians and before us. We can have a living, <coughs> excuse me, free relationship with God as a loving father based on what Jesus did for us and who we are in him. Or we can try to please God by our best efforts of keeping the rules, living in bondage as slaves, not sons. Living that way makes the whole gospel in vain. When you live that way, you call Jesus a liar. He said, you were saved by the grace of God. My blood, my body is given for you, and it's sufficient. And when you say, but I've got to do this thing, and I've got to do that thing, and I've got to observe these kinds of festivals and this kind of tradition, you're saying, no, you weren't enough. I've got to add this to it in order to make it right. It's a dangerous place to be, folks. Really dangerous place to be. You exalt your actions over the saving power of Jesus Christ. Stunning that anybody would arrive at that as a reasonable conclusion. You can't do it. Jesus is the source of salvation, not you and not me. Praise God. A good example of this is John Wesley. Before his conversion, this, David Guzik pointed this out, and I thought it was really good. Before his conversion, he was the son of a clergyman and a clergyman himself. He was orthodox in belief, faithful in morality, and full of good works. He did ministry in prisons, sweatshops, and slums. He gave food, clothing, and education to slum children. He observed both Saturday and Sunday as the Sabbath got to just really double down and make sure you've covered all the bases there, you know. He sailed from England to the American colonies as a missionary. He studied his Bible, prayed, fasted, and gave regularly. Yet all the time, he was bound in the chains of his own religious efforts because he trusted in what he could do to make himself right before God instead of trusting what Jesus had done. Later, he came to trust in Christ, in Christ only for salvation, and came to an inner assurance that he was now forgiven, saved, and a son of God. Looking back on all his religious activity before he was truly saved, he said, I had even then the faith of a servant, though not that of a son. Let us not make the mistake of living as servants of God. Let us understand who we are in Christ Jesus. We are the children of Almighty God, entitled to run into the room, throne room of God and say, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy! And he sees us with joy and picks us up and swings us around and says, hey, it's good to see you, baby. That's what we do with our own children, don't we? And that's how God is with us. He invented us. He created us to be like him he said be holy for i am holy there's an expectation there isn't there that we can be like he is oh lord i aspire to that but what i don't aspire to is to be a servant sweeping the room i want to be that child who's entitled by god to be received by him to be blessed by him to be loved by him and so I wish for all of you. If you're here today, the band's going to come forward and play, and if you're here today and you don't know that you're a child of the King, if you don't know that you're a joint heir with Jesus of all that God has, I invite you to come forward. We'll pray with you, and you can receive Jesus as your Savior. You can set aside all that past striving and you can enter into God's rest resting in the assurance of his love and favor of his unmerited favor it's undeserved but freely given and if you're online today and you're hearing this message and it's speaking to your soul I encourage you right now to just say daddy 
I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I ask your forgiveness now. And because I believe that Jesus died for my sins, I receive forgiveness right this minute. And I know that you're washing me free of all that sin and degradation, all the failures, all the false planning and screw-ups that I did. Receive Jesus now. Thank God for his son. Confess him as Lord. Just say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. I give my life to you. Take me as I am. Use me, Father God, as you will, in Jesus' name. And you too, join into this great body of believers. It's billions over the course of centuries. We're all going to be together in glory with our Lord. It's going to be magnificent. What a choir. Billions of people praising God. It's going to be great. But in this world, you can know the peace that passes all understanding. No more striving, no more fear, but just rejoicing in your salvation. Amen. Amen.